Hi everyone, and today we are going to do something a bit different, and I'm actually going to try to teach a quick history lesson based on one of my favorite topics of history, the Dutch Revolt. And while this is kind of breaking the pattern of what I usually do, I thought it would be nice to kind of expand and sort of explain why I think the Dutch Revolt is very underrated, underestimated, and is both very much, uh, you give, you reap what you sow kind of situation, and how it sort of fits into the Protestant Reformation, while at the same time, it's so deeply tied with politics of what was once part of the Burgundian territories and their Habsburg lands, that it kind of is it own little thing while also being tied to the Protestant Reformation and Protestant causes across different areas. So let's get started. What exactly was the Low Countries? What exactly was the Old Burgundian Lands? Now the Burgundian Lands were the separate part of the Valois, Valois and Capet dynasties that had the very much more profitable, kind of industrious, mer well, not quite mercantile, but merchant-based areas of France and Germany. Um, France, for a long time, tried to claim areas like the Co County of Flanders, which included parts of northern northern France, southern was today southern Belgium. Alongside this, uh, these Burgundian lands were were also intertied with dynastically, especially later with the Habsburgs. Now, Maximilian Habsburg married married the daughter of a Burgundian duke, and once she died, and their kids start inheriting inheriting these territories. Um, they became almost uncontestedly Habsburg lands. And this is all fine and well, as long as, you know, there was influence being felt, and a lot of that was tied up with the Catholic Church, the use of icons and imageries. Now, that is not to say that these lands never revolted. There were occasional revolts, occasional disturbances that oftentimes had to be put down with military force. But as the Habsburgs' influence became increasingly tied to the HRE, aka Holy Roman Empire, and Spain, and especially after like, after it became important that there was representatives in the Low Countries, usually tied to a uh, aunt of the Hab of the ruling Habsburg or sister, or in ca some cases, as we will see later with Margaret of Parma, even illegitimate daughters that married into important families. Um, having that level of presence and legitimacy was important, and that is why sometimes knighting ceremonies, knightly orders, like having that 
aura of legitimacy was very important because the Low Countries were, they each had their own civil authority province and especially with like the territories that make up was today Belgium and Luxembourg. There were different noble families, and one of those noble families that will be important here is the House of Orange slash House of Orange Nassau. Now, the, these families were very much connected to the Habsburgs and Burgundian lines. They oftentimes held multiple territories and rights across the different provinces. And as long as they had a vested interest in the Habsburgs and Burgundians, and as long as they carried out these duties and ceremonies, they had a reason to stay loyal. But as the Habsburgs became more absentee, they had different vested interests, the issues of taxes and affording the Habsburg Empire became very much important. These lands were profitable, but they still ran up debts, that kind of thing. So, what happens when the Reformation starts? What happens when there is no longer everyone agreeing on the importance of Catholicism in their own lives? What happens when not everyone starts agreeing with religious iconic icon? What happens when the great iconoclasm happens and these icons that were invested with royal money starts getting broken? And that was what kind of happened during the early stages of the Dutch Reformation. Well, people like Mary of Hungary, Margaret Habsburg, all these people who were important matriarchs of the Habsburg lines knew that they couldn't keep the Reformation at arm's length forever. And while, and while Margaret of Parma and different governors or different representatives of the Habsburgs did seek compromises in the early days, or they were willing to put down the Reformation completely, it's hard to do that in the long term. Trying to hide the cracks in your rule that is already very overstretched, especially when Charles, who, while he d was considered by all presences, pretenses, someone from the Low Countries, that wasn't really true with Philip II, who was Charles' heir for the Spanish lands and the Spanish Empire. Philip didn't really visit the Low Countries. He tried to, but that never worked. And as his illegitimate sister kept on trying to make her presence known, the fact that she was illegitimate had problems, and while her predecessors were also female, Margaret and Mary, they at least had the legitimacy to their name of being Habsburgs and inheritors and descendants of the primary lines of Burgundians. And while Margaret of Parma was a descendant of the Burgundians through her father Charles, she was still illegitimate. And so, and alongside that, by this time, Calvinism, Lutheranism, Anabaptism, all these different Reformation groups were making themselves known in the Low Countries, and a lot of lords who were still Catholic, by the way, who still had vested interests 
with the Habsburgs, like the House of Orange Nassau, who were still loyal to the Habsburgs, were trying to gain some level of religious tolerance for their constituents, for their for other noble nobles who may have started towing the line on the religious on the religious dissenters who who were trying to get money from these oftentimes Calvinists and Lutheran merchants. And the problem is Philip, who was at this time heading the Spanish Inquisition, was trying to bring that to the Netherlands. What well, was now today the Netherlands, soon back then, soon to be United Provinces, the Low Countries. So, while Margaret was willing to pause any details on this, and the problem is for the Catholic Church's presence in the Low Countries, there weren't enough clergy, there weren't really any bishops presences, and when Philip tried to insert a bishop there, a lot of stuff started snowballing. Eventually, uprisings start happening, the great iconoclasm start happening, all this stuff that a lot of the previous governesses tried to warn start happening. So, what happens now? Well, Philip did what what his predecessors did. Send an army up there, put it down, and figures like like a uh, like William William the Silent of the House of Orange Nassau went to exile and in France and of the Huguenots, the French Protestants, in their fight against the Catholic rulers of the of France. And while this was happening, um, there. And while this was happening, the Reformation in the Low Countries didn't really stop. It became part of the Northern... It became an issue for the Northern Low Country provinces. It became more of an issue, especially as the war started, an issue for the cities. So, alongside that, um, because... This felt like a revolt against Philip, even though, for the most part, figures like William still identified with the Habsburgs. It became an international issue of whether or not supporting them meant starting a war with the Habsburgs, or hence why, like, France was willing to give some low-level support, and during the early reign of Elizabeth Tudor, she was willing to give them some safe conduct in English harbors, but she wanted to maintain a sense of whatever happens I don't see it. I don't pretend to know it. Um, all this kind of attempts at neutrality while keeping, trying to play, play both sides in international politics. While then, and while France would eventually kind of bungle their attempts at interventionism, it gave enough room for William the Silent to take the reins of the war and at least keep a fighting chance in the northern provinces. The reason why the northern provinces 
became a hotbed of rebellion is Spain, while it had the New World, it didn't have the unlimited funds or manpower to push as far into the United Provinces as they could. Like, just logistically, it became this slog. And while they would capture areas like Ghent and most of was now Belgium and Luxembourg, just this war that would become the Eight Years' War, the Dutch Revolt, just like there, it became a stalemate that turned into a political line of the United Provinces and the Spanish Netherlands later after the War of Spanish Succession, the Austrian Netherlands. So, why? Well, part of it is, while I question the how great William the Silent was as a war leader, he was very much a skilled politician who, who, because his participation in the symbolism and iconography of of the Habsburgs, was able to use that for himself and legitimize his family, his dynasty, all this stuff that so that when this war of religion and political rights eventually turned into a full-blown revolt, he legitimized himself as a leader, and because most of the nobles did eventually fall back in line with the Habsburgs and the southern provinces, William, for all intents and purposes, was the only one left. And, and while there were some nobles who did remain, the vast majority returned back into the Habsburg fold, and William, while would eventually get assassinated, he left enough of a foundation for his successor, Maurice, to, once he was of age and had the political skills, would wage uh, the final bout of the war before a temporary peace would be established and, and the stalemate between the Protestant North and Catholic South became the became the difference between the United Provinces and the Spanish Low Countries. And, and while Elizabeth would eventually send some support to the United Provinces, how effective that was really depends on who re who's reporting it. And while I would argue if gave enough breathing room for Maurice to take control. England was kind of in this process, long process of a military revolution and political realignment from the late Tudors to early Stuarts to really understand whether or not England really had a chance to make their treaty of non-such into a very effective military alliance. So, yeah, that was... That was the first part in... My explanation of of the Dutch Revolt. If you like it, I will 
I will try to keep putting these out. And thank you for listening.